Yes, is a former dishwasher who became a global superstar of pop. He's as controversial as he is talented. He's just released his first album for four years, and he says it's the best he's ever done. Ladies and gentlemen, George Michael. <laughs> Fairly assume, I think, that you're among friends. <laughs> <laughs> the last time you sat in that chair, which is what, about uh, 1988, was it 98 rather? 98, 98, 98 yeah. That's right. It was, uh, became rather sort of controversial, famous interview, didn't it? And had a, an effect on your life, in a sense. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, I have to thank you for that, really, because, uh, well, one, I suppose you allowed me to put my point of view across. Actually, I didn't let you speak. Did I? <laughs> I didn't think of it. But I just wanted to thank you because it was amazing after that interview. I think maybe because I'd been off the telly for a long time and people felt I was quite unapproachable. And uh, for a while after, people thought I was very approachable. And uh, <laughs> apart from the fact that people were so nice to me, um, they spent their whole time telling me about their sexual exploits and, uh, <laughs> and where they'd been caught out and stuff like that. And it was all really very entertaining for a good best part of a year. So the public perception did change? Yeah, it was... Uh, People were so affectionate. It was um, it was quite uh, a surprise, actually. It was such a nice surprise, and and in a way, when you have when you spend so much time trying to feel what your audience feel, thinks of you through this barrage of uh, negative publicity, um, in a way, it kind of it made me. It reminded me that people had um, affection for my career at least, and and you know what I'd given to them over the years, and it was really. It's quite, it's quite alarmingly, um, it's life-changing, really. But did it make you wonder, in that sense, of course, why you, why being frightened of coming out in the first place, in a sense? Um, I mean, because, you know, you talk about the public reception. I mean, it was generally, with people said, so bloody what, basically? Yeah, I don't really think that was the, the central issue of it for me. I think the central issue was that I'd been so incredibly private and had decided years ago that I was going to deal with the fact that... Uh, you know, the press was all negative by just not taking part. And, mm. and I did know that to a degree that allowed them to make their own, to make their, you know, create their own character, what I was supposed to be, this kind of Howard Hughes, reclusive, miserable figure or whatever. And I think I changed that perception because at that point in my life I had to just be, come clean and, and be who I was, you know. And it turned out to be such a positive experience that um, I think it made me... Um, in general, uh, understand a lot more about myself. It's so strange. It seems a strange thing to say, but it was a life-changing interview. And what about in America? Did public perception there change toward you? Well, the thing is, I mean, a lot of people... I mean, again, it's, it's written that in America, you know, my, my, my career uh, plummeted after that incident. The truth was it had plummeted years before that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, years. America didn't really change it. I mean, on top of being, a, of course, on top of being uh, a fairy, I'm now apparently a communist, so I'm kind of... Oh, so you've got the double I'm whammy. A, yeah, and so yeah. in a way, I, I mean, this, to do with this album, I've decided um, that I am going to make the effort. I think, you know, I have about a million uh, diehard fans in the States that always buy my stuff, and I think a million people is a lot of people, so I think I'm going to go and try and... Uh, and I suppose re-establish my connection with my audience there and also tell people that haven't heard from me since 19, I don't know, 88. You know, I've made a few records since then, so you've missed out on a few. But, I mean, when you go over there, I mean, traveling, uh, traveling to tour from America now is difficult in any event, but, I mean, did you get uh, singled out by officialdom? So? I th they, they singled me out a couple of weeks ago, they actually. Did. I, went to see, I went to Dallas. I hadn't been to... I'd only been to America once in the last couple of years because, contrary to popular opinion, I don't live there, I live here. Um, but I'd only been out there once, and that had been fine. I went to New York, and then a couple of weeks ago, they stopped me in Dallas Airport, and uh, they spent two hours, spent two hours trying to uh, ascertain why my misdemeanor or whatever it was from years ago had not come off of my, um, my passport yet or whatever. And, I mean, I was there for two hours. I, I, I hate to think what they think, um, my, the danger to 
Well, I mean, I know what they think the danger to the community <laughs> is, but I can't see that that's very important in com you know, when you think that they're really trying to stop terrorists right now. Now, you mentioned the album there, and it's been a while since you wrote a, a solo album. I mean, 10 years, in fact, just about 10 years. Well, it's eight. Eight, eight years, eight all right. Well, that's a long time. Yeah, a long um, time. Uh, so, so why did it take this long? Um, I think, uh, I mean, I really hate to harp on about my mother's death, but I have to try and explain to people why it took such a long time. Um, when people last saw me on this show, I think I was pretty on form. But um, what I didn't realize was that the whole, what I didn't realize at the time was that the whole experience of that six month, uh, you know, supposed ordeal was really a fantastic, to distract, uh, fantastic distraction from the fact that I actually I hadn't really grieved for my mum. And, uh, and I think once that whole episode was over, and really this, this show marked an end to that, really. It was a full stop in some ways, for me at least. Um, once that was done, and after all that positive reception, um, I just plummeted and, uh, and really lost, lost a grip on my spirituality, really, which in turn stopped my writing. What does that mean? Well, I think that... I've always, you know, I've never been um, someone that was, that needed uh, organized religion, but I've always had very deep um, feelings of, of belief mm. in a greater power. Um, at the very least, at the wonder of nature, you know, in comparison to the way we play with it. And I, I genuinely, for once in my life, didn't know what was happening. Um, I couldn't make music and I felt, I suppose, because, okay, you know, because of, of two bereavements in a row, I think I felt incredibly vulnerable um, to more loss and I was just angry. What, what changed the, that oh. over to, to you know, writing the album? And it's a very good album, some wonderful songs on it. I Thank mean, you. back to top form. Um, I don't know what changed it, really. Maybe it was just a matter of time. Of time, just you know? had to come through it. Yeah. Um, one other question I want to ask you about that, uh, that incident in, in America. I mean, at the time, I remember when I talked to you, uh, I said this, this corny sort of amateur uh, uh, shrink uh, angle on it, saying that maybe, I mean, it was so blatant, the entire thing, maybe you, you wanted to declare Mm -hmm. what you were. Now I look back and I think there were certain elements that are just undeniable, you know. Apart from the fact that it was Beverly Hills, it was probably the most glamorous toilet in the world. <laughs> you know, if you're going to do it, do it right and everything. <laughs> so what you're saying in a sense was that maybe subconsciously you colluded. Yeah, I think subconsciously that was mm. my way of coming out. Mm. And talk about, you know, showbiz or what. <laughs> that was like, that was the full... I, I think... Not wholly. I mean, if it hadn't happened, I don't think I would have been heartbroken. <laughs> but I think my subconscious definitely led me into that situation. Go going back to this business about songwriting, you mentioned there the, 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 the block that you had. Um, I read that, that, that you started songwriting, I started an interest in, in music as a young child, because of an accident. What happened was I was about uh, eight years old, and I was running for lunch with about a thousand other children, all running as you do for lunch, and tripped to the top of the stairs and hit the bottom of the stairs, slid along this floor. And I don't know if you remember from old school days, but there were those huge radiators yeah. that stuck out Some like corrugated that. corrugated ones. Yeah, yeah, and they had like a point yeah. all the way across. Yeah. Yeah. And I slid along the floor and, and hit this radiator and cracked my um, head open. And... There are two things I remember about waking up. Um, one was that uh, all the kids are gone. You know, I'm laying here in a pool of blood and everyone's gone off to lunch. Uh, apart from this one girl who... I had these two girls that fought over me at seven. <laughs> and uh, I swear to God, I remember their names. Well, actually, I'm not going to name the... Um, I'm not going to name the plainer of the two girls. But there was one relatively... She wasn't plain, but there was one real corker. And... Uh, <laughs> And they used to fight over me. And the, one, and the one that was, let's say, a more homely type of girl was there when I woke up. And uh, I had, you know, I was bleeding really badly. And this girl was crying next to me. Um, but the strange thing was, about two weeks later, uh, I turned up at home with a violin. <laughs> now, I mean, I really wish to God I'd picked a different instrument. 
but that was the first one that they passed around. Uh, so I spent seven years, I decided after two weeks that this was not the instrument for me, and my parents decided, you started so you'll finish. <laughs> and, uh, and so I played it for seven years, very badly I would imagine. But before there'd been no interest there'd in music. There'd been no interest in music. Yeah. I'd, I'd been obsessed with uh, bugs and insects. And, uh, and also, I was, I was ahead of average at both English and maths. And um, what happened was within six months, I had no interest in the whole nature thing. Um, I was obsessed with music. Um, and I couldn't do maths. <laughs> Amazing. I it? couldn't do maths. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I've never actually regained my, uh, my grip on maths. I've never told my accountants that, actually. <laughs> Speaking of your accountants, uh, what's this that I hear that you're, you're actually not going to uh, uh, sell any more records? You're going to let, let people uh, on the internet free download? Yeah. Because you say you don't need the money. <laughs> Speaking of your accountants, uh, what's this that I hear that you're, you're actually not going to uh, uh, sell any more records? You're going to let, let people uh, on the internet free download? Yeah. Because you say you don't need the money? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the honest truth is... How much money uh, do, you, do you have to have before you don't need any, George? <laughs> is <there> a... <laughs> well, my real point is actually... My real po point is um, that, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a socialist by any means. Do you know what I mean? I don't believe in the ultimate um, goals of socialism. Um, but at the end of the day, I do... I mean, I kind of, I approve of capitalism, but if you were going to, if you were going to provide it as a, uh, a model that you were trying to sell to a generation of people, right, it would have a ceiling on it, wouldn't it? It would have a ceiling somewhere so that the money didn't just shoot from the bottom of society straight up to the top the way it does now. And now I think it's getting out of control and the whole of life is, is uh, out of balance because of it. So you put a salary feel, cap on yourself. I feel like I, I do feel like <laughs> I, I feel like I've always been paid too much money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I've I, always, I, think, I think pop stars, film stars... Footballers. Footballers now joined the list. Yeah, yeah. actually, footballers have been way ahead of us guys for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But, um, That's interesting. So you put a, your voluntary salary... Yeah, I on. just think... I mean, I truly believe in higher taxation yeah. for the rich. And uh, you? I've, always, I've always believed that. Yeah. And my way of, I suppose... So you wouldn't scram if they put... So, like, so you would pay now 60p in the pound tax, you would still live here, would I'd you? I'd still live here. Would you? I'd still live here if You'd get knocked the down the rush of people going over you to go leave the country, I think. I know, <laughs> I know. I understand that. And I yeah. understand that my t politics um, is not something that necessarily goes with having the kind of money I have. I just think that, you know, my way of trying to say thank you to people um, for the positive... I mean, I've had 22 years of positive feedback from the public. I mean, I love my country um, and I love my audience and I really respect my audience. I, the trouble is, I don't feel like I can feel my audience through the media that we now have. And I feel like... So um, that's where contact them directly. Though. Yeah, I can the contact them directly. I can oh. say, look, you know what, you've, you've, you've made me a rich man. You can stop paying for my money. I would like to have a site that people, instead of paying me, they actually make donate donation. some money. That's a nice idea. Um, mm. It would be really nice. It keeps the whole thing very positive. And it's some kind of antidote to, as someone who thinks that what they do is a positive thing, it's a kind of antidote to all this negativity that just kind of f is just flying at you as a, as a, as a famous but, wealthy person. I but you say, you say you're not a socialist, but of course it's well documented that you, you've met Mr. Blair. You've indeed you had dinner with Mr. Blair. But what's that got to do with socialism? <laughs> <laughs> You walked into that one. I, well, I, I, but he, of course, I mean, would, uh, would claim that the, the mutual attraction there, of course, is one rock and roller to another. Well, basically, I had, um, I had before, the, before the first election, um, you know, I was invited to the big party with the blokes from Oasis and all that stuff, and I thought, no way I'm doing that. Um, you know, rule Britannia, call Britannia and all that bollocks. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I wasn't prepared to do that. If he was going to, if I was going to be uh, one of his supporters, it had to be a private thing anyway. So, so I, I, I met up with him. Um, at the end of the uh, evening, um, as I was about to leave, Cherie said to Tony, uh, and I have to say, I really enjoyed the evening. Charming family, yeah, nice charming family. man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
don't laugh, it's true. <laughs> and Cherise said to, uh, said to me, um, oh, you've got to have Tony show you your, his guitar. <laughs> I said, oh, please don't show me your guitar, I was just about to vote for you. <laughs> and uh, you're throwing away a vote. And, um, and so, sure enough, they opened the little downstairs toilet and uh, there was a little guitar, like one of the ones you buy a 14-year-old, really, and a little amplifier. I don't know if he plays it on the bog. <laughs> I've no idea. But the, but the fact is, he showed me this little guitar, and my immediate thought, as someone who's always wanted to be, you know, in pop music, was that, that means there's some little part of you that wanted to be up there doing what I'm doing, and that means that there's something, in, you know, something similar about our egos. And, uh, you know, my ego is pretty out of control, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go back uh, to, to, to the record itself. Um, because, I mean, uh, uh, part of the record you made on, on John Lennon's piano, of course, didn't you, which you That's bought? That's right, yeah. You bought, well, the, title, you... the title track, actually, um, title track Patience, was written on that piano um, simply because I really truly believe that as history progresses, Imagine will be seen as the kind of centerpiece of the peace, love and, and understanding generation, mm. you know? And it's where it was written rather than, you know, the, it's the big white one in, in, the, in the video that everyone wants to That's see. That's right. And you turn up and you see this thing that cost me a million and a half pounds, and it, <laughs> and it kind of looks like it's from an underfunded school in Hackney. <laughs> uh, but, it's got, but it's got the original... Uh, um, fag burns on the sides. That's it. That, bit that he, you see him leaving his fags there on when on a, there was a film called Give Me Some Truth. Yeah. When and the, yeah. during the making of Imagine, uh, you see him writing the song and he's yeah. saying he just played it to Yoko and it was. It's it inspirational great. to you then in, in that sense. It was, and it was. I, I what I did was I I once I knew that the title of the album in my head, I knew I, I was going to write this little song on the piano last. I knew it had to be simple. And I knew I wanted to write it on that piano. Yeah. Um, so I wrote it on that piano, and I tried... I was going to play it on the album, but I'm a bit crap when it comes to anything. You know, with a real live piano live, oh. I'm a bit crap. So, um, so I decided to have someone else play it. So I don't play the piano, but I wrote it on that piano. It's lovely. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. But you're not going to sing that tonight. You're going to sing a no. couple of numbers. And the first that you're going to sing is, is, the, um, is the single single yeah amazing it's a good song thank you thank you, you know, very it much. really is you, you must be very happy with it well i'm kind of it's kind of unusual to hear me singing about love really in the in the context of oh i'm in love or oh, i'm like normally it's i'm so miserable <laughs> <laughs> love me love me and now and you know this song is really like i just can't believe how, how fantastic uh and life-changing this relationship is so. good that's a weird one for me, but let's see if I can manage it live. It's a lovely song, George Michael, with <laughs> your band over there. George Michael. <laughs> That, didn't you? Yeah, I like that. More music from George later on in the programme. But next, a man who does a fair impersonation of George, as well as Russell Crowe, Ozzy Osbourne, George W. Bush, Billy Connolly, whoever. He's as talented and versatile an impressionist as ever there was. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, please, John Culshaw. <laughs> So you do, I know you do me, I'm going to bore you about that <laughs> later on, actually. I'm going to bore okay. with you, but, okay. but George? Well, yes. What are you going to sing? <laughs> <laughs> if, only, if only I could sing like you, but um, I don't know, speaking, I, you know, you'd have the, um, you know, that sort of thoughtful brow, you know, that kind of thing, you know, this sort of hand gesture going on, looking up, that ba you say basically a lot, I mean, you didn't in the interview, but you do say... Go on, say the word you want to say, Elton. Elton. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
here <laughs> it. on the um, yeah on the 2D TV, George Michael. Am I really, am I really that camp? Go on. <laughs> Yeah, tell me. <laughs> tell me. I like, um, I suppose there's a bit of, you know, it's sort of Elton, you know, that sort of sound. Not far from Kenneth Williams. Oh, no. Wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> be that sort of too so far So no, loop. then. You mean no. no. Okay. <laughs> I'm not camp. I just sound like a cross between Kenneth Williams and, and John. Elton John. That's not camp. I suppose no, that's, that's very there. butch. Very butch indeed. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, what about, you've got mutual friends, Tony Blair? And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I think what I should say at this point is that, you know, <laughs> When I invited you round, you know, to dinner, you know, let's be serious about this, you know, the contents of my bathroom really were not for discussion. <laughs> and, and in a very real sense, that was not a guitar, it was a comedy toilet roll holder. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, um, we did a Dead Ringers sketch where uh, Tony Blair was, you know, pinching your lyrics for speeches, you know. Oh, really? I won't let you down. So please don't give me up. Got to have some faith in the sound. It's the one good thing that I've got. <laughs> Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. Thank you. <laughs> uh, pinned him. You pinned him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, what's the secret for a? Uh, it's not just a voice, is it? It's everything else. It's the mannerism. It's the. Yes, it's just sort of. Um, you watch lots and lots of tapes. Uh, sometimes you'll get a voice instantly. Other times it takes a little bit, uh, you know, longer. Some of the newer characters. Like Ricky Gervais, for example. Yeah. Once you've learned that one and sort of nailed it, it's quite easy because it's all down to a twitch or a, oh, okay, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, little head move, oh, little hand gesture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> so, I mean, new, new, new series or so new, new face, and he's yes. one of them, I suppose. Yes. Uh, Billy Connolly, do Billy You did him last yes. night. <laughs> oh, yes. This week, I should say. Oh, yes, yeah, so that's probably the bone you've got to, uh, to pick with me. No, no, I said later on I'll tell you about that, but oh. go on. <laughs> okay. But he's, uh, Billy's great because, you know, you don't have to, you know, whatever you say in the style of Billy Connolly, it just, like, you know, turns out funny. <laughs> you know, he just has that sort of, you know, that look in his eye when he's thinking about something to say, you know? <laughs> I hope I can get away with this. It's a beauty. Yeah. <laughs> you just, you're so mesmerising. It's just that, like, you know, you, you know, great stories coming on with, you know, when the eyebrows go and he starts <laughs> to shout. You know. Uh, you're great. Right. <laughs> what about somebody who's, who's less obvious? Well, I know that you've been working on Simon Cowell. Yes. Now, you know, new characters. You, you never have to go looking for them. You know, the strongest ones will leap out at you. And uh, I've been wanting to, you know, sort of feature him for a while. It's just, I think it's just, uh, you can, you know, it's so much fun just with the sneering. You really can. I'm going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> that was truly awful. If I was to look up feces in the dictionary, there'd be a picture of you. <laughs> that was awful. You know, he's made this, um, you know, pantomime villain it's trademark funny. of just... <laughs> So and they're trampling on poor kids' reputation. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Amazing them. you did that and your belt stayed in exactly the yeah. same place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, about, uh, what about politicians then? I mean, because Mr Howard, the Tories have got a new, new yeah. leader now since uh, you, you started yeah. the series. It's uh, nice when somebody a little bit more interesting comes along. Now, Michael Howard, I, I find, you know, <laughs> that hand gesture is a certain key and that's an odd way everybody picks up on this. The way that he says, people... <laughs> <laughs> People, <laughs> you know, it'd be good if he was here tonight. He could say Michael, George Michael, <laughs> and then later Bill. <laughs> so he'd have some good sounds to be going on with if he was. George, this we're going to show a piece of film here, and I don't want to say this personally because it's set in a public toilet. I mean, <laughs> so I mean, the, <laughs> it isn't everything these days. <laughs> you know? but, but, but what it is is he used to do, or still does, uh, they do secret filming uh, where they're going to a, a situation, and he used to go in a, in a toilet anyway as me. And he'd stand in a <laughs> stall and he'd start talking in my voice to people who came in. Now, this is the. Sorry. This is. The, you, you're not the only person who had problems in toilet. I'll tell you. Have a, have a look at this. This is the setup with, with John uh, doing me in this public toilet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm certain that's actionable, actually. I'm certain it's actionable. <laughs> but, I'm sorry, there's a funny story about that. It, well, we knew it was sort of risky. Yes. You know. And so in one of the cubicles, locked in, was a contestant on World's Strongest Man, you know, ready to burst out if anything kicked off. You know? But no, no, nothing, nothing seemed to... At the time, I'm very grateful about that, too. Uh, so. <laughs> Who was that? 
No, I mean, that, that, that essence of doing the sort of practical joke, in a sense, mm. there, is something you did very early on in your career, in your radio, wasn't it? You used to yes. ring people up and, and pretend to be other people. Famously, you got through to Tony Blair yes. by pretending to be William Hague. What other exploits did you have like that? Well, yes, on, um, a few years ago, working with um, Steve Penk, we used to do... Uh, Stallone was quite... Uh, he's one of those, you know, movie characters who's very instantly impersonatable these days. And I remember one time we phoned a hotel uh, you know, Stallone ready to make a booking, and they said, right, well, one is the one this, and the one that, and the first sight, and you go to the and then when you've sorted that out, if I can have this, and you can get a little thing, and a blue turtle. You want a great thing and a blue turtle, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. know you did those. You did all those Steve Pink wind-ups. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that's right. That you did one. Tom Baker, didn't you? Oh, t yeah, Tom Baker, I, I love his voice. It's just got so much, um, so much power. Yeah. And that wonderful laugh. That wonderful madness about him. I don't know if you've ever met or spoken oh, yes, to absolutely. Tom Baker. Some of the anecdotes he comes out with are just incredible. Nobody else could possibly sort of tell them, or, or certainly not like him. He, he, I remember it just quite out of the blue. He once said, uh, I used to be a monk, you know. <laughs> yes. I used to be a monk, and uh, I would wear the habit, and I found it very stimulating, very stimulating. <laughs> I've been walking along to the Abbey with a real throbber. You know? <laughs> 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 throbber. A real. You have to get him on. Oh, you, have yeah. to, you have to get him if on. Do. Do. You know, the closest thing to that I can think of is meeting Trevor McDonald. I shouldn't oh. say this, but I, I shouldn't say a lot of things. But <laughs> <laughs> Trevor McDonald, I met Trevor, Trevor McDonald, and, he'd, and um, he'd just come from a royal interview. I can't say who it was. I can't remember, actually. But I know he'd just come from a royal interview, and uh, his assistant asked him how it went, and he said, oh, bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even spoken to the man yet. The first word that came out of his mouth was bollocks. Well, he does, he yeah. does, Trevor. You were just Trevor doing a reggae. Yes. The yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. It's great. Brilliant. It's sort of hard to imagine. I'm trying to think now. How would Trevor McDonald say bollocks? I'm just... Bollocks! <laughs> <laughs> I believe when we come back, we will have a story that will be bollocks. <laughs> 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 okay. Let's, um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, nowadays we're talking about, you know, the way that impressions have moved on from just doing voices to, mm. to doing the entire package. You have to now to look like a person. Yes, yes. And I mean, I'm sure that you would admit you look at some work better than others. I think the, the, mm. your perfect one is Ozzy Osbourne. Oh. When we did yes. that Christmas show together, I, d I wasn't sure which was which, I have to tell you. I really, and at one point I was talking to you, thinking it was Ozzy. Right? <laughs> so, but let's just have a look at this wonderful, wonderful set of classic piece of business. You as Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Another uh, piece of business. Uh, he's, uh, sometimes you do characters, you develop a sort of fondness for them. I, mean, you know, I, I love Ozzy. He's just amazing. He's got a, a real aura about him. Yes, he has. <laughs> you know, he, like, he, he's, he's a bit sort of confused and everything. Like he's always doing that and he's there <laughs> and stuff. But he's got a real presence. Real but I mean, well, we, we met him here and did that yeah. show, and, and, and he wasn't a, a prime physical specimen, was he? Let's admit oh, that. No. And then so. the shortly after, you really had this accident on a quad bike. This was the thing. I mean, I mean, when we were actually backstage, ready to do that on yeah. the, for the Christmas show, Ozzy was sort of looking at me in the wig and glasses. Like that. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> now if I get sick, I've got a Double now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, bless him, he, had his, he, he came off his, you know, his bike Quad the next bike, day, but right, yeah. thank God he's yeah, doing much better God now. Thank God he's all right. A nice man, I see. Yeah. What, about, uh, what about doing women on the show? You <laughs> do, do Jordan. That's right? a whole different channel That's altogether. Whole, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, do Jordan. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, you know, I always loved, you know, Les Dawson and, oh. uh, you know, when uh, he and Roy Barraclough would, you know, do Sissionaid. Uh, you know, that's what's like. Norman Evans, uh, over the garden thing. wall. Hello, oh, mate. Oh, dear, I've just knocked the water over. Oh, dear. <laughs> and um, just to put, you know, uh, Jordan and Jody Marsh into that environment just seems so sort of natural. I'm just glad nobody thought of it before we managed to, you know, get it on. But it's just that sort of, oh, you know, Jody, you are looking very smashy today. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in the jungle, I saw Jenny Bond's leg, plastic, Bakelite down to the ankle in a Tupperware foot. <laughs> 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 oh, 
<laughs> and what about you? Must be actually sweating on the American election too, because George W. Bush. I mean, mm. the other guy. I mean, Mr. Kerry. He's, he's not actually. Have you got an angle on him at all? Well, the early sort of observations are to sort of paint him a little bit similar to you know Jimmy Hill or Bruce Forsyth, just because his you know his appearance. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But. Um, I mean, you know, George W. Bush, as though uh, you did a video about him. I did the voice in, the, in your Shoot the Dog video. Thank you for the job. I got 600 <laughs> British pounds. <laughs> <laughs> He's sort of like, um, as an impression character, if George Bush went, I'd probably, you know, miss him. You can have so much fun with his mangled language. Well, coming up, you're, you're halfway through a series now. Yes. The Impressable John Coleshaw. Mm. Yes. Impressable John Coleshaw. Mm. It goes out Wednesday nights on to the side. Um, and then you're going to start a new series of Day Ringers at the BBC. Yeah, Ringers is back uh, sort of May time. Excellent. Now, coming up, though, um, uh, one of the great things has been the casting of certain people to play certain people. I mean, yes. uh, Eddie Large as Claire Short, an <laughs> yes. inspirational piece of casting. <laughs> uh, why didn't anybody think of it before? Uh, what others can we expect? Well, we have got, uh, we have got John Prescott in a few sketches. Um, uh, as played by Bernard Manning. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Does it work? Well, it's a hoot, put it's it that hoot, way. Yeah. It's a hoot, put it that way. I don't think he realised where he was on the day, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, in a pure sort of pantomime sense, it was a hoot, yes. And then what about, I understand you've got a, a, an ancient David Beckham as well. Oh, yeah, yes. Now, you know, he's a fascinating character, Bex. He's been done very often. I wondered what it would be like to look 40-odd years in the future. Yeah, I just have him, you know, with that aged voice, or, you know, reflecting on his career and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, just have him a little bit, you know, sort of doddery. Oh, when I look back, you know. <laughs> we've got this, uh, we've got this hundred-year-old Alex Ferguson who never retired. <laughs> <laughs> Still hasn't retired, you know, in a bath chair at the edge of Old Trafford. Oh, you might have had a life imitating art, that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, thanks, John, for being guest. Thanks for Thank a you. very good turn. Good oh. turn, that I. John Culshaw. Thanks. <laughs> good turn. My final guest wanted to be Ernest Hemingway, so he went to France and ended up begging on the streets of Paris. He wanted to be a rock and roller, but ended up playing air guitar. Then he became an actor and could be whoever he wanted, including a rock legend, which is what he played in Love Actually, a performance winning him deservedly a BAFTA. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Nye. Move up, Ron. Oh, move up, Ron. That's it. Send, I love that. I love that <laughs> part. I love that film, actually. But that was wonderful. Where do you get all those moves from? Uh, well, um, I mean, I'm all right as long as I'm playing a, a comic rock god. If I have to play a proper rock god, I'm buggered. Are you? <laughs> uh, as long as it's supposed to be funny. But um, uh, Elvis Costello is a little-known uh, rock dancer who I always used to really enjoy. Because I had a, the complete works, all his videos on a, uh, in one thing, and I used to watch them, and he used to do lots of very strange, quirky movements, basically to be amusing, because he probably didn't take himself seriously, as I don't, as a kind <laughs> of rock love god. But, um, so a lot of that was from him, and uh, the rest is just making it up as you go along. Did you uh, want to be a rocker when you were a kid? Yeah, passionately. Did you? I yeah, I wanted to be, like I hope everybody, I wanted to, you know, I used to throw shapes in front of the wardrobe mirror. <laughs> and hope that I looked vaguely like I might one day be good in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, is that what it's about, is it? Well, apparently, yeah. Yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> that, and, uh, that and what to do during the guitar solo, which oh. I always found very scary. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, so I used to do a lot of that and hope that I'd be selected by the rock and roll gods, but it didn't happen, it and didn't I became happen. an actor instead, which is, yes. you know. But, I mean, you never, I mean, according to what I read, I mean, even that wasn't a kind of a boyhood ambition, was it? I mean, you, you kind of fell into acting, in a sense. I did a bit, yeah. I did a bit at school, um, and I was lucky because I went to an all-boys school, and if you were tall, it was a result. <laughs> because it meant you didn't have to play girls. Oh, right. Because if you had to play girls, it just meant pain and humiliation, you know, because you had to dress up and wear frocks. <laughs> um, so I was lucky in that way. And I was encouraged by um, Father Richens. He was called, we used to call him Little Richens, inevitably. 
and he was very good to me. And he, he uh, and, but I didn't really ever think I was going to take it, you know, seriously. As a but tell me about the school you went to. You went to a grammar school, and that didn't. Sort of, that was a bit difficult getting in at first. Yeah, I went to uh, I went to a Catholic primary school, and then I was uh, you, in those days. You, uh, you did the eleven plus, and if you got through, you got through. If you didn't, you went to the comprehensive school. If you got through, you went to the grammar school. I didn't quite get through. I nearly got through. So what, if you nearly got through, you got an interview. And they used to say stuff like, can you bring stuff you do from home? You know, like stuff you've prepared at home, you know, your hobby or whatever. And I didn't have any hobbies. I didn't do anything that was useful at home. So uh, in the end, I said to my dad, I went to my dad and I said, look, I've got a problem because they need stuff from home that you've done and they can show that you're clever and I've got nothing. He said, what about that painting by numbers kit? <laughs> Which, um, you know, which was, uh, you know, about all, that was about the size of it. I said, I can't take that. He said, take it. You know, it'll show, what? What's it going to show? That I can count. <laughs> uh, and that I'm, that, I'm not, that I'm not colour blind, you know, which I suppose is, recommends me. Anyway, I took it to school and it was humiliating as I'd expected it to be. And I took it up to the form mistress and I tried to wait for a kind of busy moment in class when no one was going to see. And I took it up and she said very loudly, what's that? And I said, it's, you know, oil painting by numbers. And she said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and, the, uh, you know, and, the, and the class thought it was Christmas. And no wonder you ran away. You did a couple of times, didn't you? I did, actually. I was full of, I was an average mess as a boy. And I did, <laughs> um, I did leave home a couple of times. I, I, I was full of uh, all kinds of uh, fancy ideas. And one of them, as you said, was that I wanted to be a great writer and I wanted to be Ernest Hemingway. And I did run away to Paris because I read a book called A Movable Feast. And, uh, all the, and I read all the books by anyone who'd been in Paris during, you know, in 1920 onwards. Mm. And, uh, but I didn't write a line. I did actually sit down with a blank sheet of paper once. I got to Paris and I did close the door and lock myself in with this piece of paper. And I did something which I only remembered a couple of years ago, which I thought was quite either pathetic or moving, whichever way you choose to look at it, which was that I drew a margin down the side <laughs> of the <laughs> Which is, you know, which is what you did at school. You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was my whole no, career as a novelist. You didn't write many margins ever since. <laughs> <did you>? no. <laughs> so, um, and you, the consequence of all this, of course, was that you had to go begging. I did. Yeah, I had a quite. A, we didn't call it begging. We had some other name for it. But yeah, uh, no. My friend and I used to go to the Trocadero and beg. Avez-vous un franc pour moi, Monsieur? J'ai très faim. J'ai très soif. Remains the only French I have. <laughs> Did it work? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, you used to get a few, Bob. Um, the most exciting thing was that the photographers on the Trocadero, who were there all the day along with you, used to come up uh, intermittently and show you wads of money, which used to get my friend and I extremely excited because we hadn't got any. And uh, they'd say, Madam Cuckoo's. And uh, Madam Cuckoo's, we finally worked out, was where you went and slept with women and they gave you money. They gave you 250 francs per woman. I'd never slept with a woman, so there was no chance of me going in for it, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but my friend Brendan and I, we used to sit there and work out how many women you'd have to sleep with in order to buy a Harley Davidson. Because <laughs> <laughs> there were these guys, it was before helmets, this is how long ago everything is. Uh, these guys used to drive around Paris in suits and looking really with shades and no helmet. I mean, it was so glamorous, you know, and they looked really cool on the bike. So, I mean, how old are you then? I was 17. Then. 17, and, yeah. and, and uh, still a virgin. Uh, yes, all right, all right. No, yeah. no, I'm just, no, I just, just I mean, but I mean, may, maybe, I mean, did, couldn't you think that maybe you could break your duck and, and be paid for it? No, no, no. I was sort of waiting on the future Mrs. Nye, and uh, I hadn't met her yet, so I didn't want to cheat on her before I'd met her. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, I was, uh, I was a proper romantic. I was waiting. I had names for all the kids, you know, it was pathetic. <laughs> You were know, a complete family there in your mind before I you... did, and I know their names, and I'm never, ever, ever going to tell you what they were. <laughs> but they were all blonde, and they were all beautiful, and we lived happily ever after. And she understood my pain. And <laughs> <I did>. <laughs> <laughs> but I also read, too, though, that you had a kind of a, a, a low esteem of yourself, didn't you, at the time? I mean, you didn't... I did have average difficulty persuading myself, you know, to get up in the morning. I, I, I seem to... <laughs> no, I do. I have a sort of negative turn of mind, but I'm working on it. I mean, uh, there were times when I found... And, and, and how I sort of stuck it out as a young actor, I really don't know. Because I used to stand on stage feeling so crippled, paralysed by self-consciousness. I used to stand there thinking, you just moved your hand. Why did you move your hand? You put it on your hip. Why do you put it on your hip? Nobody stands with their hand on it. Move it. I can't move it. Move over there. I can't move over there. 
You know, it was terrible. And I used to just hope that somebody would mistake me for somebody who was kind of moody. Can't move over there. You know, it was terrible. And I used to just hope that somebody would mistake me for somebody who was kind of moody. <laughs> so, I mean, I used to sort of, you know, just like do nothing and hope that, you know, they'd mistake it for talent or something. But, but there, was, there must have been a moment when you stood there on stage and actually thought, this is what I want to do. Uh, there was, yes, there was. I kind of turned pro late. I got serious because I've been very, very lucky. And, I, and in the theatre, I got to work with some of the greatest people currently operating. And there was, I remember, one time when I used to have to, I was required to, I was instructed to lie on my back down centre stage of the Olivier Theatre at the National Theatre while Dame Judi Dench would crawl all over my body and beg me not to go to Moscow. And I know I'm supposed to be lying there kind of, you know, thinking about my part and my motivation, but actually what I used to do was lie there and think, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I've had some wonderful times, and, yeah, I did kind of get serious after that. And, 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 I mean, also, too, there was a point, a moment in time, it was about 15 years ago, we did a, a show, a, a television show called Men's Room, where mm. you got a reputation, you see, as a, as a bit of a sex symbol. <laughs> now, my, what I want to ask is how did this shy boy who wouldn't sleep with those girls, in, with women in, in, in France, became this, this guy who well, it seemed very easy to me as I remember the series, I mean, in bed with these girls in front of a camera crew and all that, I mean, I just wondered. It was unbearable. Was it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> People always think it's kind of fun or something. You know, they think it's erotic. Well, <laughs> maybe your idea of eroticism, standing with a crowded room with nothing on, simulating passion, but, you know. I mean, and the other thing about it is that in those days on television, you couldn't show very much of the woman. So the man's job was largely to do with obscuring bits of her body with, with bits of yours. So you'd obscure her right breast, and then they'd say, no, you have to obscure other parts lower down, and then, you'd, then they'd say, action! <laughs> and, you're, you know, and, you're suppo and you're supposed to make love, you know. Uh, but I think if you, if you do take your clothes off on national television and nobody laughs, you just have to be great. <laughs> think, really. well, well, were the crew not helpful, though? Were they not The supportive? crew were about as far from helpful as you could possibly be. Oh, the first time I ever took my shorts off and stood naked in a room full of men, uh, the uh, lighting cameraman said, Bill, why, did, why didn't you say something? Jeez, can we have another lens down? I can't see anything. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, all right, boys, thanks, boys, you know, thanks like a bunch. I mean, you, you, you had a long career now in this, on this, on, in, as an actor, um, and, and a very successful career too, and, and particularly latterly, where you've become, I mean, just gone beyond some normal fame, you've become sort of uh, hot, haven't you? Um, I guess so. It's true. Yeah. Uh, and deservedly so too. I just, a couple of questions. I wonder why, uh, how, how it might have changed your life, this recognition you're getting now, the kind of fame that you're getting, or love actually, I mean, it's a different kind of level you've gone to. Yeah, I mean, I do now get recognised to a degree that I never used to, and I get a degree of attention that I never used to receive. Um, and I no longer get mistaken for Adam Faith. <laughs> <laughs> I used to quite routinely go and get in a cab and they'd go, hello, Mr. Faith, big fan, how are you doing? And I'd have to explain. It was either that or Dennis Waterman in the early days. No. Uh, would you mind Mr. Waterman, you know? And I'd say, well, I would, but I'm not him. But anyway, uh, um, so this is the big stuff for me. And I went to get a sausage sandwich the other day and the girls in the, uh, the, girls in the shop all went, hello, Bill, how are you doing? Do you like mustard? Bill, do you want mustard? And I thought, hang on, I've never been here before. And it sort of dawns on you that this is a different level of, uh, of recognition. Do you like it? <clears throat> Um, I'm feel, I have to stop myself standing in front of people feeling vaguely ashamed of myself, as if, I've done, as if I've made a show of myself or something, you know what I mean? But no, I mean, it's very nice, and people are very kind and sweet, and they like the work, and it's extremely nice to be in London town, which is my town, and people are kind to you, it's good. <laughs> and what about, uh, a part that I much enjoyed you uh, in was State of Play, Thank the you. Paul Abbott uh, series, um, yeah. where you played the editor. I, you know, being a journalist myself, I'm, I'm also a bit concerned when people play journalists because it seems to be that they don't get it right. But I thought you were right. absolutely right. This reptilian kind of editor. I've worked for people like that, mainly in television, actually. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that, it must be wonderful to get hold of a part like that. Yeah, I've been, I can't keep saying it, but I'll keep saying it. I've been really lucky. And when that came through the door, I sat on the sofa and read it. I think I got up to put the kettle on once, and it's six hours of TV, you know, yes. it was a rocker. And the part is a terrific part, yes. I, uh, and I've enjoyed it very much. And I became, I got fan letters, actually, from journalists yes. saying, you know, thank you very much. And I think they were grateful that for once they were portrayed in a kind of heroic way or a yeah. decent yeah. way with a bit of respect. Yeah. And I, the B BBC Radio 5 Live did a thing where they asked real-life editors uh, for uh, what they'd learned from Cameron Foster, my character, about doing their job. And I remember one of them said, 
Uh, I've learned how to save the world but still be in the pub by half past five. <laughs> <laughs> and another one said, absolutely nothing, but I want his office. <laughs> and there's another series coming up too. There is, yeah. You're in, I mean, so many things at, at present. I mean, you've got this new um, uh, costume drama coming on BBC One in April. Yeah. You're doing Magic Roundabout? I am the voice, I wonder why, of the stoned out rabbit. <laughs> uh, Dylan, uh, Dylan. I am the voice of Dylan in, in the Magic Roundabout. I'm very, very pleased to. It's like quite 20, 21st century animation. It's really cool. And uh, they've got a big cast. Robbie, uh, Robbie Williams is, uh, is Dougal and Kylie Minogue is Florence. And then, of course, the movies. I mean, you've done, um, you were a, vam a vampire, weren't you, in Underworld? Yeah, I've been, lately I'm, I've been required to play a vampire and most recently a zombie. And I think we can safely say that a pattern is emerging. <laughs> 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 so that's good, and I've also been in a film, uh, a film adaptation of an Ian McEwan novel called *Enduring Love* with Samantha Morton and Daniel. It Craig. never stops, does it? It's been very good. I feel like apologising, but I won't. <laughs> no, no, I shouldn't, uh, because I mean, when you look at your profession, I mean, there are so many people. Ninety-five percent out of work at any time, yep. and and those that do work, I mean, they hardly make a huge amount of money. The great majority of them. Quite. Mm. No, no. So there you are, Bill Nye. Thank you very much indeed, Bill Nye. Thank you very much. Thank you. My, my thanks to uh, Bill Nye and to jo John Culture and to George Michael. Now, George, you're going to do Players Out with a song. And this yeah, is. Another turn. Yeah, another turn, yeah. This is uh, John and Elvis. John and Elvis are dead, this uh, is called. Dead, Cheery old title. A cheery old title. <laughs> and it's from your new album called Patience. That's right. Okay, yeah. so, George, your band waits you over there. Thank and uh, there's no show next Saturday, <laughs> but uh, we'll return in two weeks' time when my guests will include Alistair Campbell. Rising young comedy star Jimmy Carr and the singer Nora Jones. We'll leave you with George Michael, another track from Patience, the new album. This is John and Elvis Are Dead, and this should send you to bed happy. From all of us here, a very good night. Good night.